Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Salon. This is our weekly program every Thursday night where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And we're living through a critical time in American history with the COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. Our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us glimmers of hope for the future. My guests this week are Aaron Posner, who's a playwright and director of JQA most recently at Arena Stage, Heather Raffo, playwright and actress, Nine Parts of Desire and Flash Acts, and Jimena Varela, Associate Professor and Program Director, Arts Management from American University. So a power-packed trio. First up is Aaron Posner. He's an award-winning director, playwright, teacher, and former artistic director of two theaters, both Arden Theater and New Rivers at uh, New Jersey's Two River Theater. He's directed many, many productions at major regional theaters across the country, including probably every theater in the Washington DC area. Is that right, Aaron? Every theater in the DC area? Not quite everyone, but a lot of them. A lot and always a beautiful job. He also teaches at American University and as a playwright, arena audiences saw the premiere of his power play, JQA, and his work was also featured in Arena Stages film, May 22nd. 2020. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you. So as a playwright, many of our audiences will know your adaptation work, mm -hmm. perhaps most famously of Chekhov. It's just fun to say stupid fucking bird instead of the seagull. So talk to us a little bit about your unique take on adapting because you've done it many times. Yeah, well, it's it's been a growth and an evolution. It's been a, a at least a pleasure for me to to sort of experience from adapting um, literature like The Chosen that we did with Theater J and, and Arena ten years ago, twelve years ago, um, doing novels originally that I now think of as my reverent adaptations when I was trying to serve the originating author to the best of my ability. And those were Chaim Potok things and Dostoevsky and. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, a bunch of, but I was really serving the original author. And then that shifted with Stupid Fucking Bird into doing, sort of bringing more of my own voice and my own perspective into things. So the Chekhov adaptations, District Merchants that I did for the Folger, um, those have been more taking uh, a brilliant author like Shakespeare Chekhov as a sort of playground for me to explore the things in the theater that I love and, uh, put more honestly put more of myself and my own perspective and what I've learned over the years sort of put those into those worlds, which has been um, a joy. Aaron, how do you know when something is right for you to adapt? Is it just something that your nose tells you this is right? Is it because you're drawn to the ideas, the themes because somebody asks you to? What is it because you've you've adapted short stories and novels and plays and it's fascinating really. It's been all of those things, although it's something, if the playground feels like per, draws me, I mean, I'm a, I have a very relational uh, way of working in terms of directing, in terms of teaching. I believe in sort of forming a relationship with either the character you're playing or the material you're doing. So if the material talks to me and I feel like I have something to say back to it. If we can have a conversation, so directing something like Va Vanya, Sonia, Masha and Spike that I did with you guys, like I love you, it's not my world, but I loved that world. What a fun world that was to play in. Um, the, the, the Chekhov, that the struggle of the everyday and of good people doing their best and messing it up a lot of the times this speaks <laughs> deeply to who to who I am and in my view of the world so if if um you know there's been times when I've been asked to adapt something or direct something where I read it and I think this is great but and while it might even say something to me I don't think I have anything interesting enough to say back so I can't have a a really mutually beneficial relationship with it. So if, if I feel like it has something to offer me and I can offer something to it, then I'm, I'm in and I'm excited to do the work. So on JQA, which is all about John Quincy Adams, 
was the character that drew you there no, John wasn't. Quincy Adams or was it the time or what was it it was it, well it was you saying do I want to write something about power and government in America and the honor of doing that at arena in Washington DC and to talk about things that I've been thinking about um you know I don't a lot for years about our relationship to government and what government is and what we really want from it and why people are saying smaller government, why people hate the government so much, why we need the government so much, all of this incredible polarization that exists. The chance that's what was that's what drew me in. And then John Quincy Adams became a vehicle for those conversations. So this was it wasn't it never meant to be about John Quincy Adams. It ended up being partially about John Quincy Adams. And I got fascinated by him and his family. But it was really that, like talking about, you know, in a non-expert way, not for down from the I mean, I hope that it came off that way. Like I was never trying to instruct anybody. I was just trying to engage people with my own curiosities and puzzles and difficulties with the with sort of being an American and how we live in relation to this overwhelming force of the government. And indeed you did it and you did it beautifully with yeah. allowing many, many different characters to be John Quincy Adams so that we ended up feeling like, oh, of course, some of the ideas that he had are still with us today. So I'm curious, here we are in the middle of the pandemic and have you been creating any new work in other ways during this time or anything new you're doing in terms of your teaching? Because you're a prolific teacher too. Everything I'm doing is new. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I've feel like i been saying everything is adjacent to things I know how to do well. Like uh, I've been, I directed for radio for the ACA and I direct, helped direct, you know, worked on the, the, the May 22nd project for you guys and part, and part of the arena marketplace where I'm working, coaching people and teaching at American University where I'm just thrilled to be, but teaching directing online like direct that's just a that's just a crazy thing to do i did a devised piece with the freshman there everything i've been doing even being a, a parent during and a husband during quarantine is different um i'm learning how to try and do those things well but i'm in ex you know i'm inexpert at all of it so i for me because i have been so i'm so grateful and i've been so fortunate that we are not in dire straits there have been as difficult as this pandemic is for so many people um i there have been real gifts of of growth and of learning and of trying to do new things and uh staying uh staying open to learning and and uh and and trying to take all the good things that can possibly come out of it so i've been very grateful love it i love it okay we just have a few minutes left but i have a crazy question to ask you because I made a joke really early on that there was probably going to be a lot of bad theater that comes from this isolation. And I'm curious about what lasting impacts do you think there will be when our theaters, our physical spaces start to reopen? Because of course, artists have been busy creating and producing. We're just doing it in dozens of different ways. Yeah. Um, how do you think it's going to shift, Aaron? Well, I think I think the the social upheaval of the last six months is going to be a more profound effect on the theater going forward than COVID is. I think people, I think COVID, the, the move towards technology and the expansion of our ways of thinking will open the tent a little bit. We'll expand some ways we think about performance, but at the core of it, we're gonna come back to live people in live rooms, breathing and laughing and talking and dancing and engaging with each other. And I think we're gonna be hungry for it and we're gonna come rushing back when we can do it safely. But there's gonna be different people in the rooms and there's gonna be thinking and the thinking for all of us is different, is profoundly different because of what's been going on in the country for these last nine months. Again, not about COVID, but about um, anti-racism and engaging with the wider community and, and finding a new balances and a new place in it. So I think that's gonna have the more profound effect. I think it's gonna, like any effect, there's gonna, it's gonna tip in various directions, but I think it's going to be good. I think, I, I'm excited, I have to say like not propaganda-ish, but I'm excited about when we get back together, I think we will have grown, I think we will have changed, and I think we'll have a lot to say, and hopefully a lot of people who are eager to, to hear and to engage with us. Um, I think people want their storytellers back, 
and I hope that, and I think we're going to have a lot of good stories to tell. And I'm sure some terrible ones about plagues. And you know, like, I'm sure you're right. There's going to be some, some people are going to write some wonderfully terrible plays, but that's always been the case. All right, Aaron, let's go. I think you've re-energized me about going back to the theater. Awesome. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope to see you really soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. See you soon. Bye-bye. Next up is Heather Raffo. Uh, she's a solo performer. She's a writer. Uh, she wrote the international hit, Nine Parts of Desire, which details the lives of nine Iraqi women. And she garnered multiple awards and accolades for her creation and her performance of Nine Parts of Desire. It had a national and an international tour. Uh, she's also an actor on stage and in film and a librettist, and there she is. Hi, Heather. Hi, Molly, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm uh, good. It was so many years ago, Heather, it was probably, was it like 15 years ago when you raised? 2006. 2006. So term elections of 2006. So it's 14 years, I was kind of close. Yeah. Um, you were at Krieger stage with Nine Parts of Desire, and I was reading an interview with you about your new play over the last like probably four years ago Nora and was struck by the theme of individualism right. versus community and America is known for and often touts its individualism which can be freeing if a person is from a culture that didn't prize it and I'm just curious in this moment of a global pandemic do you feel renewed tension between individualism and community I do feel renewed tension. I do feel that Iraq's a bellwether for America. And that this, you know, we've prided ourselves on rugged individualism in America for so long. And as you say, it's, 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 there's so many positives to that. But without the fabric of community and truly looking out for each other, we're in a crisis. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see, this isn't meant to sound off, but I'm excited to see how COVID can continue to bring us together and can continue to weave us into a community that's all suffered something collectively and what we can make of that. Yeah, I think that um, everybody has felt such pain sometimes the enormous pain of losing people that we've loved. And other times it's the pain of losing jobs, losing positions, uh, losing the ability to be able to see family in different parts of the country. Um, and it's, how do we, how do we, how do you quantify that as a, as a writer? And we just got something from Andrew said, this is very meaty stuff. So thank you, Andrew. I'm glad. I'm glad that it is. Um, how do you how do you work within that as a writer? Is that taking you in another production uh, direction as a writer, Heather? It is, and I'll and I'll get into how it's. I I think of loss as a currency to a new value system. Right. So if the currency we may be coming out of or currently we're in is, I mean, in an economic term is one of profit or capitalism or individualism in the pursuit of that, that this collective loss is its own currency toward community. And I think that what we're really after is a shift in value system. We're after it in the theater. We're after it in our economics. We're after it across the globe. We're after it in climate. So I think that everything I'm writing about has been trying to pick up what the value system is and see if I can work with it, change it, bring something new to light so that audiences can can get on it quicker. <laughs> we're all we're all ready, I think. I really do think we're all really ready for the new value system. It just it's in the process of presenting itself and being yeah. integrated across the board, not just in the theater in the theater, in our economics, in our climate, right? What happens when things speed up though? I mean, I, I, I believe 
we're in the middle of the creation of a different value system too. But what happens then if speed starts to move into urgency starts to move? You see what I mean? Does the value system then change again? I guess I'm less afraid of the speed of change is that I am that it's going in the right direction. If it's going in the right direction, let it go as fast as it can. No, nobody pre-COVID could have predicted the speed with which we have had to reckon and reevaluate our value system, even though artists were always saying, let's reckon with and reevaluate our artist system. Like, like even what I'm trying to say is even those, those people that were predicting or wanting or hungering could still not have imagined the speed. So I'm not, I'm less afraid of speed as it, I just want it to be in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, happily, we're going to have a lot of changes in America very, very soon uh, because of uh, the election. So you've always been dedicated to women's voices. Mm -hmm. And because we're starting to talk about politics, um, we have the first woman vice president. How incredible is that? How important is that? And the first woman of color. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling to me, but I'd, I'd like to know from you and your perspective, how it is for you and how it is for you because you have children as well. It's really inspiring. And it's really inspiring to the feminist daughter I'm raising and the feminist son I'm raising. Um, it's also in my community as an Iraqi American, it's really inspiring that she is both black and Asian and American and all. I mean, it's, it's, it's a incredible trifecta. Um, yeah, I think that I couldn't be happier on that front. And, and I, I think that it's really beautiful to watch it through the eyes of my daughter who's 11 and who thinks this is a world of possibility. And I remember being, I mean, truly this pregnant when Obama won and we were literally on the streets. I live in Brooklyn, so we were out in the streets of, of Brooklyn and thinking, oh my God, I really am bringing her into a new world. Um, and then we've lived through all we've lived through with the ups and downs, right? I mean, as much as she was raised with eight years of Obama, she, her, her last four years, um, it's hard to explain what a child thinks of Trump because it's kind of everything you're, you're trying to get your child to understand isn't, isn't the way one should behave, right? So it's both a new world of possibility, but also like a, they've got to go make something of themselves. Great. We just have a couple minutes left, Heather, but can you give us a little taste of the epic that you're working on now? I'm working on, a, on an epic play about um, migration and the global economy. So back to my original point, I'm, I'm tracking currencies. I'm tracking currencies as they relate to value. It's a, it's a play that takes place all over the world. There might be there might be an element of the virtual world being able to support this world I'm making in a way that the live theater couldn't. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm, I keep thinking about these value systems and how they relate to where we need to go. Right. Well, I can't wait to read your new play. Awesome. Uh, and uh, I know it's, it's gonna be uh, terrific. So thanks so much Thank you. for coming on, Heather. And I think everybody that's listening is going to be looking forward to uh, hearing what's next from you. Thanks, Molly. Good talking Bye. to you. Bye. Next up is Jimena Varela, who is the director of the Arts Management Program and Department of Performing Arts at American University. And she's a researcher, she's an educator, she's a consultant, she's a writer with more than 25 years of experience in arts management curricular design, both on campus and online, museum management, international cultural policy, management practice, 
marketing strategy, arts management research, and culturally sustainable development. She's a skilled negotiator and facilitator. She's served with and advised international organizations, national and regional governments, city agencies, as well as private and nonprofit organizations in arts funding and arts policy. Hi, Jimena. Hi, Molly. Oh my God, I, your resume is unbelievable. I was in a hurry at a certain point in my life. That's no longer as true. <clears throat> you were, you were, well, you still are. And Jimena, it's just been such a joy to work with you and Andrew and American University Thank and you. SEMA, uh, partnering on the Artistic Director Intensive, uh, a program focused on early tenure artistic directors mm -hmm. of theaters. And I think our audience probably doesn't know that we started the program because there's a ton of training opportunities for managers, but none for artistic directors. It's like they get right. thrown in and sink or swim. And That's our right. cohort began just a year ago and then the pandemic consumed us. Tell us a little about what you've learned uh, from these 10 artistic directors. Oh my goodness. Um that artistic directors are amazing. Uh, they, we started this project because we, we had seen, as you said, there were little, there were few opportunities for them to, for, to get training uh, in the management part of artistic direction. And we brought together uh, with you and with SEMA and with my research partner, Andrew Taylor at AU, we brought together this incredible cohort of 10 um, new artistic directors from all around the country, from Alaska to Minnesota, to Alabama, to every, you know, so many different places and they uh, and when we met with them we asked them what the major issues they were dealing with at the time because we wanted to help them in that transition and we worked on those issues and then boom eight months later they were thrust in the middle of a pandemic while they were figuring those things out so I think what I've learned from them is their profound intelligence and resilience I know it's an overused word but for them it's really it's a word that was meant to be for them their sense of solidarity too, both with their staffs and the artists that they work with and with each other. Um, I've just been so humbled. These are people who are incredibly accomplished, uh, who could have had in some cases an easier out and they chose to stay and, and fight the good fight for their staffs and for their artists. So, um, and their singular dedication um, to the mission of their theaters and to their artistic vision uh, is just astonishing. So it's, it's been, a, it's. I went into this project thinking it was, um, you know, a usual kind of consulting training project and it's turned into the one Zoom meeting a week that I do not miss. I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, that sounded wrong. That for no reason, that would, nothing would make me miss. Uh, uh, that I, it's the one, the one that I look forward to because it's just an extraordinary group. Well, I, I love what you're saying about their resilience too. Because mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of resilience and adaptability. Yeah. Yes, they're adapting to the new world that that's a part that I keep learning from them yeah. about how quickly they're learning new processes and, and new ways of working. Absolutely. And I think one of the um, I work with a lot of, of, of people in a lot of different kinds of organizations and industry within the arts and this group, this group of artistic directors, what I saw from them was a, a sort of leaning into the current. And just jumping into the current and going and trying to figure out how to navigate this whole new situation. Whereas in, in some other places or some other uh, sectors, what I've seen is either paralysis or resistance. Resistance, holding on tight to a rock on the edge of the river until things but go back to normal. And they won't go back to normal. They certainly, they certainly won't go back to the normal that we knew. This is a new world and a new structure. Um, so, so for this group, what has been impressive is that they've looked at this torrent and started to look around for the tools that they have and how they can help each other navigate this torrent and, and uh, but not losing sight of who they are or what their what their mandate is it's, it's pretty it's pretty incredible no oh, i i completely agree with you on that um many people probably don't know how much of a writer you are and i would love for you to talk about this um really provocative idea that you had long before the pandemic. And what are you writing about, Jimena? Well, thank you. Actually, I have to thank you, Molly, for the end of my writer's block. I had a, 
a three-year substantial writer's block, my younger son became very ill and had, had been very ill for the past three years, and I found I couldn't write. Um, he began to get better, and one day, Molly, uh, you emailed me and said, I want to read about this thing that you're writing. And I got to writing because when you tell somebody you want to, when Molly says something, you start doing it, I've learned. <laughs> so thank you for lifting my writer's block. Um, this project began because my field is arts management and I'm very interested in the history of arts management practice and where it came from. A lot of the research in arts management tends to focus on the more recent history when it became an academic profession. So from the 1960s onward. And I was interested in seeing, well, what are these practices that we have in arts management? For example, box offices, uh, audiences, marketing, where, where did they come from in the arts? They didn't just emerge 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So I was um, looking back into history to see what we had that was documented that would include all the major functions of arts management. So it would have elements of cultural policy, fundraising, uh, financial management, marketing. And I started looking at uh, something called the York Mystery Plays in which were produced immediately after the Black Death in the North of England. And I was in York doing this research when I got a call from my university saying, I had, this was in March of this year, come back right now um, because of the pandemic. Um, so I had to get a plane and come back to the United States. While I was researching this artistic um, expression, this artistic pursuit that had been modified and was impacted by the Black Death. So it was very much like a Russian nesting doll of problems. And I was reading at the time Connie Willis's novel, Doomsday, about a historian who researches the Black Death. And what I began to look at then was um, that we know a lot about what art emerged after pandemics, after historical pandemics. We know nothing about the artists themselves very little about the artists and even less about the arts managers, the people who are making the arts happen and be accessible to, to the public. So I began to then research the Black Death in, the Black Death in terms of its impact on artists um, and look at other pandemics as well. And my criteria was that they had to be universal pandemics. So things that caused massive amounts of harm on a global scale. So I was looking, I'm looking at the Spanish flu as well. And I'm looking at the pandemic of the 17th century as well and trying to see what happens to artists during these periods? Um, and it's just been really, really fascinating to see that um, even though the past is another country and, and um, they do things differently there, I just heard Dr. Emma Wells from the University of York give a, a speech where she said, well, actually it's the same country. We just, it is, it is the same territory. Um, and there are humans there who behave in similar ways. And that is what I'm finding about, about the artists. So what do you, what do you find happens to artists during these time periods, Jimena? Nothing good in the beginning, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> but, but what happens is that artists are, um, artists adapt. Artists adapt very, very quickly, faster than anybody else, because they are always responding to whatever is going on around them. So they respond to changes in everything, in sponsorship, in materials, um, not so much in subject matter, but in expression and in connection to audience. Those are the big shifts that we see after each one of these pandemics, the way that the art is delivered to audience and connected, um, and the way that resources are generated around arts suffer, uh, go undergo profound changes. And those artists that, as I said before, with this group of, of artistic directors that look at the current, marshal the resources and work together, those are the ones that survive and, and create a new artistic world. I love it. I love it. Okay. We just have about a minute left, if you can believe mm -hmm. it. Yes. <laughs> um, but I would love to know from you, what glimmers of hope are you seeing in the future? I think that this pandemic, I'm, I'm with Aaron, I think there are some gifts of this pandemic. I think it has yanked us into the 21st century, whether we want to or not. Uh, it's yanked us technologically, socially, in terms of values. It sent us all home to think about what we've done um, to this planet and to society. It's made us all stay at home and really reflect on what matters. Uh, in terms of our connections and our obligations to each other, to the planet, to our to our friends and to our communities. And um, to Heather's point about the individual versus community, it's highlighted the importance, at least for half of the country, uh, the importance of community and the importance of, of really embracing and fighting for the values that we believe in. So that's, that's my glimmer of hope. Beautiful, beautiful. And I completely agree with you. I mean, I think it's a time of great racial reckoning. And I think we will see it in our theaters as well as in boardrooms around the country. Yeah, I, I think so. 
Exciting. Well, so beautiful to see you, Jimena. Thank you. Great to see you too, Molly. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Take care. Bye. My guest next week will be Jackson Gay, who is the director of Kleptocracy, Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Soteriadis, who's the chief of strategic foresight and futures branch at the United States Air Force. He works at the Pentagon. So I thought it'd be great to bring in a futurist uh, around the military. And Kyle Donnelly, director and former artistic, associate artistic director from 1992 to 1998. And now for our gift of art, the artist marketplace is open. It's open for business. We've got tons of gifts for the holidays. And if you haven't stopped in yet, please do. Almost every performing artist that you know is out of work. And this is a way for you to help support artists on an individual basis. So uh, let's watch this uh, short video and uh, get on and uh, buy from the artists. Thanks. Arena Stages Theater Artist Marketplace gives the public the opportunity to commission or purchase a work of art safely with no in-person contact from the artists and the artisans who have graced Arena's stages. The pandemic disrupted the ability for artists and theaters to earn income, but when you make a purchase through the marketplace, you're generating much needed financial support for artists right now and a percentage supports Arena Stage. On the marketplace, you will find uplifting messages by Don Ursula. Kate Baldwin and Nicholas Rodriguez are offering personalized greetings, voice lessons, private virtual concerts, and meet and greets. You can get hand-done original drawings by Ken McDonald, public speaking lessons by Lisa Nathans or Zach Campion, original music compositions by Victor Simonson, beautiful rock garden designs by David Leong, Timothy Thompson will convert your analog videos and photos to digital. You can get cooking lessons with singing from Kirsten Wyatt, a virtual writing salon for you and your friends by Mary Hall Surface, scenic model pieces by Paige Hathaway, and you can even get one-on-one -on -one coaching with four-time Academy Award nominee, Marsha Mason. More artists will be added to Arena Stage Theatre Artists Marketplace, so be sure to check back.